open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, and we'll get started in verse 31. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible today, which is a little bit different, but uh, I think I, I think it's a good translation. If yours differs from mine, good. <laughs> we should always be reading different translations and trying to get at the words of scripture from as many different angles as possible. And this is especially true when we're reading parables, because the parables of Jesus are stories. They're, they're these rich, short stories with um, all these different interpretive angles. And so if we're reading them the exact same way, we're going to miss a bit of the content of what Jesus is trying to tell us. So this parable that I'm starting with is the parable of the mustard seed. And I have heard so many different ways of presenting this. The, the one that I find the most interesting are people who try to take it as literally true. And that's because nothing that Jesus says in this parable is literally true. So before I get into that, let's let's take a look at the parable itself. In verse 31 it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a person took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. And I prepared a couple slides here just to demonstrate that Jesus is exaggerating. Perhaps, <clears throat> although humor rarely translates well, but perhaps in the original language this was also for humorous effect. And on the first slide you, you'll see here there's the yellow mustard seed um, in the upper left corner, second from the top. Yellow mustard. Notice it's definitely one of the smaller seeds, but it's not the smallest. Like I would argue the cumin right next to it is almost is, is smaller in volume, but it's a longer seed. So maybe that wouldn't count. How about those carom seeds? Those are a bit smaller. You know, or at the bottom there, the black cumin, the white poppy seeds, which, by the way, grew in Israel. Poppies grew all over Asia, and they grew in Israel at the time Jesus was living. Those white poppy seeds are by far smaller than the mustard seeds. So that isn't literally true. <clears throat> he says, but when it's fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree. Well, mustard grows to about five feet in height. And you can see it growing wild here in California. Um, I don't know where you would find any, especially this time of year in the autumn, but um, it is an invasive species here in California. It grows wild and it grows everywhere. So when you see little yellow flowers, that's possibly mustard. And Jesus says it grows so tall that the birds can nest in its branches. I did find one picture of a bird in a mustard plant. And this is, I believe, a kind of robin. I could be wrong. I'm not an expert on birds. But you'll notice in the picture here, it is just grasping on for dear life. It is, it is perched, but that mustard seed is nowhere near, that mustard plant, excuse me, is nowhere near large enough for even one bird to nest in it. So if you're trying to read this parable literally, not one word of it is literally true. Why is that? Why does Jesus exaggerate so much well, let's look at what he's comparing it to. Jesus compares the mustard plant to a tree. And what's important to know about trees? What do trees represent to us? When 
I think of a tree in a garden, and I'll show you this last picture here of a tree. I think of it as towering over all the other plants, right? The tree, when you think, when you're taught about how forest ecology works, you're taught about trees and bushes and low growing plants, and that they depend on one another, that the trees provide shade for the other plants that the bushes provide shade for the critters which eat the little plants, right? You're taught all these things in school, and the trees are these great majestic things. In fact, when we talk about an oak tree, we talk about, in mythological sense, the oak tree or the world tree in Norse mythology or Indian mythology. Um, and we could talk about trees as being these great things in which the world itself is nested in its branches. Trees in mythology are a symbol of greatness, of grandeur. And that's definitely the picture we get here with the tree in the middle of the mustard field. The tree stands head and shoulders above everything else. And that is where its greatness comes from that it is greater in stature, it is greater in prestige. Well, Jesus says the mustard plant becomes a tree. And if we think of the tree symbolically, then the mustard plant symbolically becomes like a tree in stature. But how? It grows from a seed. And when we talked about the previous parables, the seeds represented the word of God. And if the mustard seed is growing from the word of God, well, it's becoming a mustard plant. And a mustard plant doesn't achieve greatness in the way a tree does. It achieves greatness in the way a mustard plant does by being, well, here in California at least, invasive. It grows like a weed. It grows everywhere. You can see this field full of mustard plants, and there's not one other kind of plant there. Now, that is where the mustard plant's greatness comes from. Not by being tall in stature, but by being contagious. By being... By being... Uh, the same as everyone else, in other words. It's, its greatness doesn't come from being greater than anyone. It comes from supporting everyone around it. In fact, Jesus says that the birds can nest in its branches. Well, we see that it does provide shelter for birds, but not in the same way as an oak tree. An oak tree can be a nest for a whole flock of birds, right? but a mustard plant might only support one or two. And they're certainly not nesting in it. They're going to perch in it when they need it. somewhere to perch. That's not permanent shelter, that's temporary shelter. That is that the bird has been out searching for food all day and it's tired and it needs a place to perch where you know cats aren't going to find it. It's gonna be up high. Well, five feet on a plant that barely supports a bird is enough to get away from cats. And it might not be the same as an oak tree. It might not be able to provide as much support, but it does provide support to those who need it. That is the mustard tree's greatness, being able to provide just a little bit of support in those times of trouble. And if you wonder, well, doesn't God want great oak trees for his kingdom? Let's look at the other parables as well and see if this idea runs through it. In the next parable, the parable of leaven, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. All right, that's yeast. Which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour, now it's 60 pounds of flour, until it was all leavened. Now it doesn't say 
that the woman worked in the yeast. It doesn't say she mixed it in. It says she hid it. And that's very different from what we would expect. We would expect someone to knead the bread, right? To work it in. But she doesn't. She just puts it there and lets the yeast do the work. Well, if like the seed, the yeast represents the word of God, then we don't have to, as, as I do sometimes in my sermons, uh, beat each person over the head with the word of God. We just have to say, by the way, God loves you. By the way, you know, Jesus died for our sin. By the way, hey, do you need, do you need help with that? We just have to be there when people need us. And that plants the seed of the Word of God. And the yeast will work all through the flower, all on its own. Next we see a little bit of a change in the interpretive frame because what is the value of the kingdom if it can do all this on its own? Does it have any value? Mustard plants, by the way, they're everywhere. Do they have any value? Well, we see the next parable, the treasure of the field. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again. Now, where did he hide it? Probably in the same place he found it. Because next we see, and from joy over it, he goes and sells everything that he has and buys that field. Now, why does he buy the field to get the treasure? He already had the treasure. Well, he could have the treasure, but not own the treasure. Because when you buy a field in ancient Israel, you not only bought the field, but everything in it. So when the person who didn't know the treasure was there sold the field, he also sold the treasure. Now the man legitimately owns the treasure. How much is it worth? Everything this man had. But uh, farmers aren't known for being wealthy. So what about merchants? The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant selling fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold everything that he had and bought it. Not only is the kingdom worth everything we have, but once we have that treasure, once we have that word of God and it has worked its way through our hearts, we are no longer the same person. This person was a merchant of fine pearls, but a merchant has to buy and sell. Once he sells everything he has, and by the way, is he selling it at what it's worth? If you sell everything all at once, are you going to get you know, the total value of what it's worth? No. Nah. You know, I used to work at a liquor store, and there was one bottle of, um, I believe it was a kind of cognac that sold for $3,000. At least it would sell for $3,000 if anyone ever bought it. It sat on that shelf for two years that I know of without anyone ever buying it. Now, if that liquor store, if the owner of the liquor store were to sell everything all at once, is he going to get $3,000 for that bottle when it hasn't sold in two years? No, he's holding on to that bottle because it's going to sell for that price. So this man sold everything that he had. He probably didn't get its full value. To buy this fine pearl. And once he bought it... He no longer has the money to go and sell again. He's not going to sell this pearl. He is no longer a seller of pearls. He is no longer a merchant. Once he has the kingdom of God, he is no longer the person he was before. The word of God has transformed him into something else. And Jesus doesn't tell us what he is now. He only tells us that the kingdom will transform us fully. 
So who can receive this pearl? Who can find this treasure in the field? Who can be transformed by the word of God? Jesus tells us one final parable about this. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. All right, that's a net that you cast into the water and it drags from top to bottom and it catches all of the fish. And it was cast into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when, when it was filled, they pulled it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. Now this is actually pretty odd for a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee because just on the other side of that sea is the Decapolis. And in the Decapolis, there's a lot of Greek-speaking people. And they have no problem eating whatever kind of fish because they don't have to separate the clean from the unclean fish. So a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee would read this and say, why are they throwing away the fish? They can just sail to the other side of the sea and sell all of them. And where are they throwing them away? Probably catch and release. They're throwing them back into the water. Every kind of fish was dragged up onto the shore. Every kind of fish could be cleaned. If you're looking for the Word of God to transform your life, there is no reason that it can't. There is no reason why that seed once planted cannot grow. Because there aren't two kinds of fish in this world. Just as when Peter was presented with the animals of every kind and God said to him, do not call unclean what I have made clean. So there is only one kind of fish, the clean kind. Every person in this world is clean by God's grace. And that is the word of God that Jesus is preaching to us. That if you can accept it, this word of life, this word of love, this word of unconditional forgiveness can transform you from within. And it can give you the power to not only support yourself as the mustard plant does, but to support all the little birds in your life. All those hungry, tired little birds that just need a moment of rest. That you will find a community of mustard plants those like yourself, those whose lives have been transformed by the Word of God, and who hunger for righteousness, who hunger to do what is good. That is what Jesus is promising. Community, transformation, and a word that is worth more than everything in this world, everything that we can and do have. That once we have that word, it will transform us from within. That we will not be just ourselves anymore. We will be that perfect creation of God. That when God looked on the sixth day and said, this is good. This is what I meant to create. So, if you want to feel that transformation, if you're ready for that transformation, then come and be baptized. Come and let God transform your life and experience the love and presence of God in this community. Amen.